interoperability. This is just an example, there are many. Uh, this is an example of a movable slam in which we can do mapping over trajectories which are tens of kilometers, you know, very large scale. Um, and the system I think, works just out of the box. You don't need to find tune too much. Uh, so the robustness is pretty good at this point. You can put just qualitatively a couple of other data points. You can think about the state of the art in to be semantic understanding, in particular when it comes to supervised deep learning. And you can think about these, um, okay, we have some labeled training data, we try to test these are real data. What you get out of the state of the art in deep learning is always like, you know, less robustness, there is a limit to generalization that you can get, and of course, less scalability. So this would work uh, typically in image space sometimes, and will work just close to the training domain. This, by the way, like, you know, it's uh, just a tradition of supervised framework. I'm not even talking about language and bad things, people, and so on. And you can think about this getting to an extreme if you think about 3D deep learning. Okay. So robustness, you lose some robustness, you lose some scalability, and of course, what you gain is a huge amount of scene understanding. And now you can start seeing semantics, and you start, can start understanding semantics in both 2D and 3D. Our goal is pretty simple. We want to see if we can beat this trade-off in which uh, either you are very robust and you are very scalable, or you understand a lot, but you are not as robust. Like to be over here, and have algorithms that are uh, uh, scalable, robust, self-supervised, and enable real-time scene understanding for robotics. What I'm going to do in this talk, the talk will be in uh, three parts. I'm going to describe the progress we made in each of these axes. I'm going to start talking about scene understanding, then I'm going to talk about scale uh, robustness, and I will conclude about scalability and self-supervised learning. So each part of the talk is going to start with a slide like this. So if you don't pay attention to anything else, just pay attention to these three slides, you'll get a good summary of what the talk is about. So these three slides, like, you know, again, one uh, at the beginning of each part is going to uh, show that, you know, what is the main takeaway point of that part. And by the way, the three parts of the talk are really uneven in terms of length. I think the first one is a little bit longer and a bit higher level, and the last part will be just about the last five minutes, okay? So there will be different, there will have different sources. The first message I want to send to this part is that highly interactive and scalable robot perception requires metric semantic, hierarchical map representations, and spatial perception systems to build them in real time. Let me say this again. The future of robotics will need metric semantic and hierarchical maps. And of course, you want some algorithm that is building them efficiently in real time. I want to spend a couple of slides convincing you about why we need metric semantic and we need hierarchical. I will spend close to zero effort in convincing that uh, we need metric semantic maps. If I want to tell the robot, robot, go grab it a cup of coffee on the desk, the robot will need to know jumping, we need to know how to avoid obstacles as it moves, but we'll also need to know what is a desk, what is the cup of coffee, so we we'll need to know to have some semantic understanding of the scene. And back in 2019, we had this work which was doing essentially the extension of SLAM to metric semantic understanding. Uh, I will show you this briefly, I would say that right now there are much better systems doing this. But the good thing is that uh, this is something that we can do right now, like you know, we have open source code, we can do this in CPU, so it's a very lightweight algorithm. But essentially what you see here is what is called Chimera, which is a system which is taking camera images and mining data, and uh, is producing as a result a 3D mesh, so a 3D model of the environment where the 2D mesh is describing the geometry of the environment, but also each phase of the mesh is color coded with a different semantic label. For example, the, uh, I don't know, the green is the woods, gray is the ground, and different colors will correspond to different classes of objects. So hopefully everybody will be on the same page. We do need, if you want the robot to exhibit complex instruction, the robot will need to understand semantics, will need to understand geometry. It's a little bit of a tougher set to convince you about the need for hierarchical representations. But I will try. So I will try with an example, which is the case in which we want to build a metric semantic map of a flat. So not a huge map, but you know, just a small apartment scene. And I want to do a little bit of back of the envelope calculation about doing metric, metric semantic maps which are flat versus hierarchical representation. I want to contrast these two representations. So let's start from the traditional uh, metric semantic representation, like a flat representation. So imagine, for example, that I have a voxel based representation of the flat of the apartment I was showing before. And now for each voxel, we want to store some semantic information. Maybe we want to store that uh, the given voxel is an obstacle, we want to store that it's a bed, we want to store that it belongs to a bedroom, belongs to some apartment, belongs to a building, and so on. 
dar să nu le fie un take too much effort to realize that, you know, we have to do the same type of storage or the semantic information for each voxel in the map, which will lead to a memory consumption, will be, which will be n, which scales with l and v over uh, delta q. So l is the number of tables, and v over delta q is the volume over the size of the voxel, so that's the number of voxels. And say it's something very simple, you have to store just l labels for each voxel, right? So this is why, like in, a, in an apartment scene, um, the number of voxels is maybe in the thousands, but you know, not like, very, very large. And maybe with some supervised deep learning, like you know, the number of labels could be the order of like, 100, maybe 1,000, is not a crazy number. Uh, at the same time, here we're thinking about the future of robotics, right? We're thinking about the case in which we're going to go very large scale. So if you consider an area, even a flat area, which is 10 kilometers per 10 kilometers, the number of boxes will be at a decent resolution we get in the billions. Okay? So this will be like in billions. And if you look at the uh, number of words in the English dictionary, which is the largest set of concepts that we can put in our robot, the end can be as large as half a meter. So in this like a very large scale application, you can have memory consumption, which is half a million multiplied by billions. So you can easily get a like, you know, bottleneck in terms of memory. Hierarchical representation partially like you know save you from that memory bottom. So inside is as simple as it gets. Essentially, if you have objects, you can realize that you know objects can be grouped into rooms, rooms can be grouped into apartments, apartments can be grouped into buildings. So you can just reorganize the same information as uh, a graph structure. Let's say a tree structure, but more generally as a graph structure. And you realize that by doing the math of the memory consumption, you realize that maybe you still want to store voxels. And this will be like the number of boxes. But now to store the semantics, you can just store the number of rooms, the number of buildings, so you get huge compression out of that. And, um, and of course, if you don't want to pay the price of storing the number of boxes, you can have sparser representations, meaning you can have more topological representations of the three space, which instead of having like, you know, billions of boxes, will have just much sparser topological representation of the map. So this is a very long way to say that hierarchical representation scale better in terms of memory requirement. And also when we start thinking about the graphs, map, which are essentially graphs, it becomes particularly easy to capture relation between things, right? We're already capturing relation to the edges of the graph. This relation means that uh, the stove is at some location in the, in the map. This relation means that the stove is in the kitchen. This edge means that the kitchen is in the apartment. But you can also add other types of edges. Like you can say that there is an edge saying that the kitchen is uh, next door from the dining room. We can, either, you know, uh, we can have arbitrary pairwise relations between the, the concepts in this one. There is another point which is a little bit more uh, involved, a little bit more mathematical. This part, again, I will not go very deep mathematically. But the point is that hierarchical graph, and that's something that we prove in our uh, in a very tonal type, that you must know, have the reference in the next slide. But hierarchical graphs, which are graphs with this structure, have low trivials, which makes inference faster in graphical work. If you don't know what is the trivial, you can think about the trivial as being a measure of complexity of a graph. You know, graphs with small trivial would be efficient to do inference. Now you might say, look up, look, we are in 2023, we don't care about you know inference in graphical models, we just care about graph neural networks and like you know uh, deep learning. The interesting thing is that I'm going to show that in a few slides that uh, with modern architectures for graph neural networks, the fundamental limit of what you can represent with that architecture is still dictated by the three width. Okay, so the three width, having a low three width is a good news regardless of what engine you use for inference, whether a graph neural network or, uh, or a standard like you know probabilistic graphical model. So Looking at all these uh, opportunities in using hierarchical representations, we ended up focusing on a specific type of hierarchical uh, representation, which we call C-graphs. Uh, full disclosure, like, you know, the first work on C-graphs, at least the first that you know, that is close to ours, is from uh, Stanford, from Mirror Manny, so full credit square, uh, work that was produced in computer vision. What we have been doing is to apply these ideas in a robotic setup and get algorithms that can be these representations in uh, real time. He said the previous work was about building them offline with some manual intervention. Okay. So what is a C-graph? Um, C-graph is uh, a hierarchical representation where at the bottom we start with dense 
metric semantic maps, that was the one that I was showing before. But as you go up in the hierarchy, you are abstracting away dense geometry into high-level concepts. You are abstracting away the geometry in terms of objects and agents at layer two, rooms, buildings. The only thing that is a bit strange is these layer three, which are the faces and structures. So structures are essentially walls, ceiling, uh, ground, and so on. Places are a topological representation of a free space. Okay? So the graph of places is a graph where the nodes are free space locations, and ages represent the versatility. So essentially, this graph is uh, telling the robot where it can navigate without hitting obstacles. So more formally, a scene graph needs generic instantiation. It's a graph where nodes are spatial concepts, which is anything that lives in between. And ages represent relations between concepts. For example, an agent can be in some room at time. The reason why we believe that there's a lot of potential in this representation, uh, first of all, I already happened in the previous slide that hierarchical representation are scalable, efficient for inference, very flexible in capturing relations. But for those of you working in uh, mapping, you realize that this representation includes all the type of map representation that we've been using in robotics for the last 30 years, let's see. There is a metric map, you know, a dense metric map, which is the bottom level. There is a landmark case map which is the level of objects, or the layer of objects. And it's a topological map, which is the layer of places. So this is unifying like, all the maps we, we like um, in a single representation. And this representation is actionable. If uh, I'm able to build this map in real time, I can tell my robot, robot to go grab me the cup of coffee, I don't know, some object here, to grab me the chair in, the, in some room, I can read the, where the robot executes complex instructions using this representation. So what I want to do next is to tell you a little bit about how to build this representation in real time. And I'm going to highlight three main elements to it. So there are three steps I'm going to, to showcase. A little bit at a higher level, but, uh, but uh, hopefully like, you, know, you will get the gist of it. So the first aspect of constructing this representation in real time is about building an automatic version of the model. So it's the case in which as we go, we estimate the authority of the robot around this automatic path, we try to reconstruct a scene graph, which might drift over time, but it's still like, you know, not a consistent representation. And the way you have to picture this is similar to what I have in the, in the video. The robot is starting without any kind of knowledge about the environment. It's building like, you know, a metric semantic map as it goes. It's extracting from this metric semantic map the objects. And of course, it's building its own trajectory, in the automatic trajectory. And then it's extracting a graph of phases, and it's clustering the graph of phases into different rooms, buildings, and so on. So I would say in this part, there, is, there are some cool aspects, but a lot of it is just standard geometric or slant type reasoning. In particular, the construction of the mesh, um, not even very sophisticated, but using things like you know, box blocks or like you know, libraries for uh, box based reconstruction, and then we convert the result into a mesh. Um, for the pieces, we are extracting this graph, which looks pretty messy, but this is what is called the generalized Voronoi diagram of the free space. So it's kind of a summary, like a compressed representation of the free space. And the other thing is that to extract the rules from this graph of places, we have an interesting technique, and you know, we're not going to repeat this, which is based on persistent topology, which is finding like, you know, patterns in this graph to identify different rules in the graph. Again, high level problems. After you build an automatic scene graph, of course, the automatic scene graph will be over time. So this is a real experiment just to show people what I'm talking about. Like, you know, there is uh, uh, still a resonance. The robot is going to still a resonance. Some images disappear for privacy reasons if there is a person there to like, remove the image. Uh, and here you see the scene graph being built. The scene graph is a little bit complicated, so let me comment on that. Essentially, the robot is starting on floor number one. It's going upstairs, and it's going to floor number two. These two corners are supposed to be one on top of the other, but you see that there is a huge drift. So the robot, um, and this is more visible in the top view of the scene graph. So the top corridor and the second floor is not aligned with the corridor on the first floor. And what we have been studying is also how to correct, how to generalize the notion of loop closure in slam to these kind of hierarchical representations. The contribution that you will find in the paper, I think that's pretty nice. So first of all, one contribution is about place recognition. Um, the robot is going to the second floor and it's coming back and we have to recognize that the face it is visiting is matching a place that's been before. 
And the realization here is that while typical in computer vision and robotics, you do that just by using images. Essentially, you compare visual descriptors. Here we have a lot of extra information, right? We know about the objects which are surrounding at each location. We know about the room types. We know about the building. So we have all these layers of the scene graph which are carrying information about the place, right? What we do, we describe, we, we provide hierarchical descriptors which are capturing all this information to the much better place recognition in a nutshell. After we have these meshes for place recognition, we generalize the typical slab to closure optimization in what we call 3D scene graph optimization. Essentially, we formulate a single optimization problem which is deforming at the same time the trajectory of the robot, the mesh, and the graph of places in a single optimization. And we show mathematically that actually that's again post-graph optimization. You don't need a fancy optimization problem, it's just standard post-graph optimization. So you can use standard tools such as GTSM to optimize a single graph in same idea of time in seconds. Okay, so uh, I will skip like you know the quantitative results we get to the little talk. But uh, I will show like, you know, a couple of slides in which I want to convince that this guy running real time on a robot. Um, the video is an early one, I think this, like, this point is almost two years old. Uh, you see an A1, which is moving like, you know, in, uh, in uh, building 31 and 80, and it's gradually constructing like, in a single, maybe segmented in rooms, and the most important bit in this slide is this table, which is summarizing the runtime of the construction of each layer, object, places, rooms, on an Nvidia Xavier, so on a small credit card sized uh, computer. And you can see that we can do all this in a matter of milliseconds. So this can run in real time on an actual robot. If I play the video, the semantics is not very interesting, but you know, the map will look about right. And out of these two efforts that I told you, like you know, the reconstruction of the automatic scene graph and the correction to loop closure, you have to imagine that the result we get is something like this. It's, uh, there is the mesh, there are the objects, not very visible, but you can see bounding boxes and the shape of a chair here, for example. In an early version of this paper, we also had humans moving around. It's very easy to explore the easiest part of this work, but uh, in the latest uh, work, we did not that part, but we were able to reconstruct the trajectory of humans moving around. And if you look at the top of the scene graph, like you know, doing this uh, 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 topology based approach, we were able to isolate the different rooms and uh, you know, understand that there are, I don't know, 16 rooms in the building, and there is, of course, a single building in this case. So if you start closely at this video, you realize that uh, in this layer we have the semantics. We detect, you know, from the mesh we have all the semantics of the object. So we know that it is a chair, for example. We know that it's a human. But if you start closely at this uh, at this video, you realize that the, at this level we still don't know which ones are the rooms. We are able to geometrically cluster the rooms, but we don't know if room six is the kitchen or the bathroom. And that's what I want to do as last uh, piece of this puzzle, which is inferring missing labels in the signal. So with the type of geometric reasoning I discussed so far, we're able to get a scene graph, which has semantics at the lower levels, but does not know the semantics for rooms, buildings, and so on. And the reason why is that we don't have a like, train deep learning model, which is a vector rooms. We don't want to train them. As humans, it turns out that you know, we do this process in a pretty seamless way by just looking at the objects around us. So we look around, and uh, if in a room there is a bed, there is a book, there is a chair, there is a clock, most likely we will be able to infer that bedroom is a bedroom. We like to do the same thing, like, you know, with an algorithm on our robot. Traditional way to do that would be something like, you know, traditional probabilistic graphical models. Now we want to take a little bit of a fresher look because we don't want to hand tune all the factors. So, the other baseline would be graph neural networks. How many of you are familiar with graph neural networks? Graph neural networks, uh, let's say that you want to infer the label of uh, nodes in the graph. For example, we have given objects here, we know that this is a chair, uh, this is a clock, and so on, and we would like to populate the label for this, saying that that's a vector. The way you do that is that you do some message passing, neural network being message passing, and you give an embedding vector for each, for each node. And then there is an MLP classifier, which is classifying that embed embedding vector like, you know, into a room label. We could use this, and indeed in the next slide I'm going to show you this as a baseline, but we thought we could do a little bit better. And I will show you uh, the contribution of a very new paper which we compressed just in this video, because it's a very simple idea. Um, 
So we propose an alternative to standard graphic neural network. This alternative is called the neural tree. And what you see in this paper is that actually you don't want to do message passing on the graph. You want to transform the graph into a tree using something that's called tree decomposition, standard like your graph theoretical approach. And then you can do message passing on the tree instead. So again, no message passing on the original graph. You first get a tree and then you do message passing. And I'm going to show you the next slide by just doing this very simple tip. That's the one sentence summary of the paper. You get much better theoretical performance and practical performance as well. If you're not familiar with tree decomposition, you can see what's happening here. So the tree is kind of collecting subgraphs of the original graph, right? So the top node of the tree is actually a subgraph. And then, like, you know, all the things going down, there are different subgraphs of the, of the original graph. So what we do is a uh, radical result. I will not spend too much time on this. I will give you a lecture just the bottom line. The radical result is saying that uh, if you define, even a graph, if you design a probability distribution over a graph, let's call this probability distribution f, and then you call g the set of functions that can be produced by your neural tree, by this neural method. Essentially, we can prove that uh, the neural tree is able to always compute something that is close to the probability distribution over a graph up to an error epsilon. And the number of parameters, let's say the number of weights in the neural network that we need is something that is proportional um, to the number of nodes in the graph, which is not bad, with a linear relation type of things. The only thing that is exponential, which is bad, is the tree width of the graph. So this is a long way to say that, uh, this result is saying that if you have graphs with small tree width, you can approximate, with the neural tree, you can approximate any distribution over these graphs. And luckily, like your previous slide before, I proved, or like you know, I showed the fact that you know, seeing graphs the way they are built, they are both with it. Yeah. So we're in Bushy, essentially theoretically, we can show that we can approximate any distribution of a seeing graph with a small number of parameters. That's good. So the number of para parameters needed by neural T is linear in the number of nodes and only exponential in the figure. We don't care about theoretical results, maybe we care more about the practical performance. So we tested those, uh, the neural key idea, into a, a single graph classification problem in which you have even single graph and want to infer missing labels in objects or rooms. And we use a standard data set, which is the Stanford 3D data set. And the metric that we're going to see in this table are the percentage of correct guesses. So these are the percentage of nodes that we classify correctly. Ideally, we would like this to be 100%, right? And what we do on the rows of this column, we show different types of message passing, not very important. But we compare on the columns um, what happens if you do message passing on the original graph. That's the state of the art in graph neural networks. With what happens if you do message passing on the neural tree, which is the proposed approach. Just by doing this trick of converting the graph into a tree and doing message passing, we get a huge performance boost. You know, getting 10% improvement with this simple trick is kind of a you know, cool result. You don't pay much, if you have the small tree, you don't pay much of a uh, runtime cost. And indeed, doing the message passing on the original graph is 46 milliseconds in the forward pass, and it's 65 milliseconds in the real tree. So you can do this in real time. How do we use this? How do we integrate this in the construction of scene graph? So Hydra is the name of our overall system, which is building scene graph in real time. So after integrating this idea of the real tree, the picture that we have is something like this. The robot is starting in a completely unknown environment. It's moving around. It's estimating its own trajectory. It's building a mesh of the environment. It's identifying objects that can be able appliances, sink, and so on. And then this neural tree is taking this object and is inferring what is the room type. So we start with the kitchen, and there is a hallway, blah, blah, blah. All this is running in real time. Again, it's combining a little bit of a traditional slam with graph neural networks working at the top level for inference. If you start close enough at this video, actually not all the rooms are classified correctly. And there is a very simple explanation for that. There are certain rooms which have very distinctive objects. A bed is a very distinctive object for a bedroom. There are rooms which are not, which do not have the same, like for example, pool rooms do not have like, very distinctive objects. So they're a bit harder to classify. So we've been uh, uh, showcasing the um, potential use of scene graphs in many applications. I will just present a slide over that. 
going quite fast, but in terms of applications, let me show you that if you do planning hierarchically, just motion planning hierarchically on the scene graph, you can reduce the computational time of doing motion planning, comparing the e star on the DSDF, which is a voxel based representation. This is the number of seconds it takes to do motion planning over voxel based representation. We can reduce that time you know, by several orders of magnitude just by planning on the scene graph. Um, we show that you can provide a scene graph for enforcement learning policy to guide object search. That's like, you know, last year. So we can show that that's a suitable representation over, uh, also for like, you know, policies with uh, enforcement learning policies. In this case, the robot is about searching objects in the environment, and we show that you know, we can get a performance boost with respect to pixel to action approaches to enforcement learning. And we also show applications to uh, move the robot um, Application will not go into that, but there are many others. So there is task emotion planning, human robot, robot interaction, visual QA, monitoring prediction. And uh, if you don't believe me, you look at the work from Corian, who's doing like, you know, uh, just exciting work in the area of using this singer for uh, task emotion planning or for task planning. So that's work from, I guess, some of you guys in this room, maybe, like with Corian, very exciting work. So many applications for, uh, for these hierarchical representations. Now I want to switch gears. Again, like, you know, this part is going to go a little bit deeper. And the part is about what he mentioned, like, you know, about this idea of certifiable algorithms. And I will explain the connection in a second. Uh, the message I want to give in this second part is that safety critical and high integrity applications require certifiable estimation algorithms. They are able to distinguish correct estimates from incorrect ones. So here, we would like to have certifiable algorithms that are telling me if I detect an object, I want an algorithm telling me is the detection correct or not. Of and I'll formalize this idea in a, in a second. So the context for this work on certifiable algorithms is that in the background of uh, all the nice videos I'm showing in the first part of the presentation, we're just solving a bunch of estimation problems. Okay? So in the single construction and so on, we solve problems such as object code estimation, <laughs> three component clouds of cameras, and then we solve some code optimization problem with the single. And so we decided to look a little bit more closely at the map of these estimation problems. The nice thing is that despite the variability like, you know, the differences in these problems, there is a very common unified formulation, which is essentially optimal estimation, or maximum likelihood estimation, in which we formulate these estimation problems as an optimization problem, in which we want to figure out some variable. Yes, this can be, for example, the pose of the car you want to localize, given measurements by I. The measurements can be typically as some detections of key points type of things, but there are some pre-processing of the image data. And you want to estimate the X in a way to minimize some residual error, which is measuring is a given function, which is measuring how well your estimate is explaining the data, is explaining the Y. And of course, you have a large set of measurements F. So this is standard nonlinear least squares. It's nothing scary. In practice, you have to do something more, because the key issue is that many of these measurements will be Outliers in practice. What does it mean? I take an image, I would like to extract key points in the car, for example, I would like to extract the wheels, the, the, the lights, the you know, mirrors, and so on. But some of the detections from my neural network or whatever I use, like you know, to extract features, might be completely incorrect. These are the outliers. And people in robust statistics, like you know, back in the 60s, told us not a big deal, there is an easy change you can do, which is instead of using a square norm, you can just use a robust loss function. Nothing super surprising, right? What people in robust statistics didn't tell us is how to solve the corresponding optimization problem. And indeed, back in, I don't know, 2006, probably there is something earlier than that, it's been well known that you know, for typical choices of robust loss function, the problem is intractable. You cannot figure out polynomial time algorithms to solve this optimization problem to optimize it. Um, this problem has been studying they studied like, you know, really uh, extensively in computer vision and robotics. I will trivialize the state of the art into two families of approaches. In robotics, local solvers are very popular. Think about maybe Gauss-Newton or gradient descent. You start at some initial guess for the X, and you go down here looking for the you know, next <coughs> best solution, like for a local minimum. It is well known that you know, uh, these local solvers are really stuck in local minima, and in some cases you have no initial guess. You do not have a good initial guess for what the X should be. 
il robot in computer vision uh, della Transac, la prima Transac è un algorithm, but for those of you who are familiar with the Transac, will fail with probability one if you have too many outliers. That's like a mathematical part. Um, Transac mostly works for low dimensional programs and is non deterministic. But the thing that really bothered us like, you know, about both approaches is that they will fail without notice. They will give an estimate. The estimate can be completely wrong, but they don't know. They will not be able to know if the estimate is wrong or not. So we try to push the boundary of the state of the art with these ideas of certifiable algorithms. Certifiable algorithms in a single sentence are algorithms that compute an estimate, and the certified is the optimal estimate for the detect failure otherwise. Either they give you the optimal estimate, optimal solution of this optimization problem, or they tell you I was not able to solve it. Okay. So the truth is that you know, we've been working on this for maybe like, you know, more than five years at this point. I'd say close to eight years at this point. So we don't have that, you know, just a single algorithm. We have a family of like, you know, algorithms that we develop to solve these kind of robust estimation problems. Algorithms are ranging from uh, graph theoretic approaches, which are pruning away bad measurements, to approaches based on the non complexity, which will smooth out to make the optimization problem nicer. To approaches based on moment relaxations, which are the key to certify optimality of the solution of these problems. What I want to do today, I want to focus on the most mathematical of the three, which is the moment relaxations, and I want to present in very simple terms what is the idea of a moment relaxation. I will explain that you know, uh, in a couple of slides. So, out of all these approaches, I'll focus just on this and I will tell you where the optimality guarantees are coming from. Before I jump into the math, I just want to uh, <laughs> motivate you guys to follow like, you know, the rest of the math by telling you that if you do the math right, uh, typically you get a huge performance boost in practice. So, hopefully, you will see that you know, there is a good reason to do that. And indeed, the algorithms have been working on, uh, on this line of work on several algorithms. You know, I've been producing algorithms for, for time cloud registration, which are robust to 95% random outliers. Means I give you 100 measurements, 95 of them are garbage. We can still solve them you know, and find the right, you know, the file which are correct. And this is really open source. At uh, RSS, a couple of years ago, we've been releasing some data, also figuring out the shape of the project. And we have also algorithms to slam post graph optimization type of things. All these algorithms, if you look at the details, are kind of running in real time. They have robust and extreme amounts of outliers. Some of them have been picked out by picked up by you know, things like GTSM or MATLAB. So the work on uh, post graph optimization is now part of MATLAB's navigation toolbox. So it works pretty well. Hopefully this will convince you to follow. I do not have more. I think I have three or four slides of the room on the mat, but this will go a little bit deeper. Um, Stay with me, I think this part is very general. If you're not working in estimation, if you're not working on outliers and so on, the tools I'm going to describe are so general that you might end up using uh, these for other problems. And indeed, I know that you know, there are many people who will be familiar with this machinery. But, you know, hopefully, this will be a nice, uh, simple overview at the top. So the question is, we want to solve the optimality and optimization problem, which is like this, we want to compute the x. We have some function which is the residual, and we have some function which is the robust loss. How do we get performance guarantees? How do we get optimality guarantees when solving this problem? There are two insights. The first insight to get optimality guarantee, guarantees is that a large set of robust estimation problems in robot perception can be formulated as polynomial optimization problems. Since the math pool, like, you know, what is a polynomial optimization problem? is an optimization problem in which both the cost function and the constraints are just polynomials. x1 squared plus 2x2, whatever polynomials with real coefficients you want to draw. How do we show that many problems can be recast as polynomial optimization problems? By inspection, pretty much. So we look at the literature, we look at the long list of uh, typical foundational problems in computer vision and robotics, single rotation averaging, which is fundamental for calibration, multiple rotation averaging, which is from its level, fracture promotion, post graph optimization, and all this, and we try to convert each one of them to a polynomial optimization problem. Let me give a very simple example, which is point cloud registration. In point cloud registration, you are given two sets of points, P and Q, and you want to find the rotation and translation aligning these points. Okay? It's a very like, you know, foundational problem. But if you stare at this problem, you realize that with respect to the variables, i and t, 
the objective in a quadratic function, which is, of course, a polynomial. Suddenly, the bit that you know, requires a little bit more expertise is also to realize that uh, the constraint of the rotation being uh, the being a rotation matrix can also be written as something that is a quadratic constraint, so can be written also as a quadratic polynomial. So, so far we've been showing that essentially for different choices of the residual error, this problem is polynomial. Now we have to worry a bit more about the row, you know, what is the loss function. What we show is that for seven different choices of the robust loss function, very common choices. From Kennedy squares, maximum consensus, like, you know, uh, general McCool, uh, Uber, L1, you know, all these choices we show that we can still keep an expression which is polynomial. And I will give you an example that, you know, from the from Kennedy squares. So from Kennedy squares, some of these squares will be just a quadratic. From Kennedy squares will be quadratic for uh, measurements with small effort that will be flat otherwise, which is about saying measurements with large residual, I don't want them to impact my estimate. Okay? So how do we demonstrate that uh, by choosing the truncated squares you get some polynomial, some bit, you know, in some of the key essentially into the binary value of theta, which uh, when the theta is zero, uh, when the theta is one, the problem becomes a you know, linear with squares. When the theta is equal to zero, this disappears and you get the constant. So essentially the introduction of the binary variable theta is just switching between this behavior, the quadratic one, and the flat behavior. And if you set at this, like, you know, there is a binary constraint, but a binary constraint, first of all, it's an you can write easily as a polynomial constraint. And also, like, you know, if you, before you had a quadratic polynomial, now you just have a cubic polynomial. That's not the big one, still a polynomial. Okay. And you can generalize what I'm saying as an example to all the other cost functions using some that is called the black Lagarde and Y. So like some technical things that we have So hopefully so far I convinced you that uh, for uh, many, many problems showing up, many, many robust perception problems showing up uh, in our applications, we can just take these and write them as polynomial optimization problems. Very elegant. Now we have the gen general family of general formulation, which is encompassing all the problems we care about, are not very useful because polynomial optimization problems are still hard to solve. You can prove that you, know, you can do binary optimization, integer optimization, yeah, but there is a very rich set of problems, so we haven't gained much in terms of tractability. Okay? We haven't gained much in terms of like, fast algorithms. That is where the second insight comes in, which is polynomial optimization can be relaxed for complex semi-definite relaxation using a tool which is called Lasserre hierarchy of moment relaxations. So how many of you are familiar with Lasserre uh, moment relaxation? Okay, so this is more than what I typically get, like you know, when I give seminars, which is a good sign, but uh, since like a great 10% of you guys, I want to give you one slide of a view of Lasserre hierarchy, it is a very powerful tool. Okay? So how do you transform a polynomial optimization problem into something that is complex, into something that is more practical. I will give the recipe and uh, I will take just a couple of assumptions just to make things simple. The assumptions I'm going to think is that the x is just uh, including two values, like you know, x1 and x2. In principle, you can have more, but you know, for example, with two variables. And you will assume that the degree of the polynomials is less than four. That's actually realistic. All the problems I was discussing before that will have to be at most three. And I'm going to assume for this slide that we just have a quality constraints because that's a bit, a bit simpler than So what I said, what the moment relaxation is going to tell you is that you have to do two steps. So the first one is that instead of just solving for x1 and x2, you have to over-parameterize the problem a bit by defining what is called the monomial basis. Monomial basis is defining all the monomials of dp0, in this case dp2, and the function of your variables. Instead of just solving x1 and x2, now we solve x1 and x2, x1 squared, x1 2, x1 and x2, x2 squared, and you decide at which order you want to stop. In this case, I stop at order 2, but you can go higher if you want. And the second step is that given the monomial basis, you do the monomial basis by itself, multiplied by itself, and you get what is called the moment matrix. Okay. This is a huge over-parameterization of our problem. So instead of computing x1 and x2, now we want to compute the matrix of unknowns. Okay. While this is good news, the, the single fact 
which is maybe like you know, this formation of the Mohan matrix useful, which is if you start closely at this Mohan matrix, the Mohan matrix will contain all the monomials of P0 up to degree 4. So essentially, I can write any polynomial of degree up to 4 as a linear combination of the entries of this matrix, right? I can pick, you know, x1 plus 2 x1 cube. I can pick all the entries, I can form any polynomial I want up to degree 4. So in other words, I'm saying I can take the original problem and I can rewrite P, H, and G as linear functions of the moment matrix. Okay? Instead of that, these are polynomial of the up to 4, I can just write them as a linear function of the, of the moment matrix. So I can take the objective, for example, I can replace it as a linear product of a non matrix multiplied the moment matrix. The constraints are going to be the same, I can have a linear constraint which is replacing the HI equals 0. So in other words, we just replaced, you know, we started from a very tough non convex optimization problem, and now we're getting some problem which has a linear uh, objective and linear constraint. So what is the catch? Of course, like we're starting from an intractable, probably intractable optimization problem, and we're getting something that's completely linear. The catch is in the definition of the moment matrix. So the moment matrix is by construction a vector by itself, which is positive semi-definite. No problem, we can have four steps as a convex constraint. But also being a vector by itself, this means that the, run, the rank of the matrix X is 1. And that's a non-convex constraint. So the, the only thing we have to do is we drop that constraint. So the relaxation is about keeping everything but dropping the rank constraint. And in the recipe, we also take a lot of other extra constraints to make this a little bit better. So we started from a difficult non-complex problem, and we got something that is called a semi-definite program that you can solve in polynomial time. You can just use all the shelf algorithms to solve this. Why, I'm so, why am I so excited about you know, this conversion from uh, polynomial optimization to this semi-definite program? Well, the reason why I think this is exciting is that Lasser, together with this recipe on how to convert the problem into a complex relaxation, is providing a theorem about the properties of the complex relaxation. I will now ask you to read this. The two messages of the theorem are, uh, the two main messages are the following. <clears throat> First message is that if you solve the complex relaxation, again, this time you can solve the polynomial time, you get an x, which is rank 1. Then you can prove that you can decompose the x into something that is the unique optimal solution of the original problem. In other words, if you solve this problem, you get the rank 1 solution, you're done. You solve the original problem to prove about the market. And the second property tells you that if you go, uh, if you make the defeat of the monomial basis large enough, or in other words, if you make the x large enough, eventually you get the rank one solution. So eventually, if you keep growing in just the defeat, you will get a provably optimal solution to the original problem. So this is why this stuff is interesting from a theoretical standpoint. From the empirical standpoint, the interest is the, you know, the motivation, the reason why this is cool is that there is an empirical observation that uh, this relaxation is tight, which means you don't lose anything there is no approximation, meaning that the solution is producing rank one matrices. At the lowest relaxation order, which is a uh, you know, technical way to say for small axis, relatively small axis, and the relaxation remains tight even if you sparsify with some trick to reduce the size here on part. So in a nutshell, the conclusion is that for the first time that we can solve robust estimation problems in robotics to optimality or uh, even to a sum of the gap if you don't get rank one solutions, which is which is pretty good. And by the way, like I shout out you know about the work happening here. There are many people that you know building on top of this research or like advancing this research, and in this area of certifiable algorithms is something that uh, uh, Seems pretty promising that there are great results, and you guys have, uh, have uh, also part of that, are also pushing the boundaries there, which is great. So I will not tell you, like, you know, I'm not show too many uh, practical results, I will show you just one slide in which for three different problems, I would like to show maybe the suboptimality. So if the suboptimality is zero, it means that you can get an optimal solution, and prove the optimal solution. And what I want to look at is the suboptimality. Again, we would like this to be close to zero. And I'd like just to uh, for you to focus on stride, which is our SDP solver. So if you look at the uh, blue backpots, essentially you can see that the suboptimality
functionality, we get into that relaxation is fine. Like the time minus 10, time minus 10, maybe uh, time minus 7. Essentially, we're able to compute probably optimal solution in uh, the majority of cases, even if we keep increasing the number of outliers. And of course, you said this plot, you said there are like many cases in which you cannot compute optimal solutions. You cannot demonstrate that you compute optimal solutions. That's expected. This is an empty up problem. You cannot hope to solve everything in polynomial time to optimize. So what you're doing is that you're happy that in 99% of the instances we get optimal solutions. In the case in which we don't just declare failure, and we say, be careful, you cannot trust this estimate. And the figure on the right is just showing that if you get optimal solutions, you get you know good estimation errors that are not combined. So I'm running late, so we'll go for the last like you know three to five minutes, maybe we'll cover the last part, which is Going beyond certification and talking about self supervision. Yep. So, the message here is that uh, certification and self supervision are twin challenges. If we can certify correctness, we can learn without supervision. Let me um, set up the scene like, you know, for, uh, for this part. So, in the previous part, I said we have some measurements, maybe we extract key points in the image space, and then we solve some optimization problem um, to get an estimate, for example, to estimate the pose of the car in this case. Now I realize that the key points are typically extracted by what is called the perception front end. That's typically a neural network. So the neural network will take me into the image and we figure out how to extract key points in this image. These are not the sift type of key points, these are semantic key points, meaning that you know, the key points will correspond to the wheels of the car, the physical locations, you know, specific locations in the car. And the question we ask here is now that we have much better like transformation models. Can we use them to self supervise, to feed back information and self supervise the neural network, to improve the neural network? And then we show this idea like, you know, in an animation, it is a very simple idea. So, what we do is that imagine that uh, we are given a neural network which is maybe trained in simulation. So, it's not great, you know, they seem to be a gap, like it's not perfect. What we do at test time, we want to learn from new data without failures. So, at test time, we are given, for example, three images. And we want to learn more from these images without minor related with them. So the approach here is that we can uh, take a forward pass on our neural network. Again, the neural network is not perfect, so we get a bunch of like, you know, a bunch of detection wrong. Then we apply what's the power of the and some of the cases will be correct, some of the cases will be off. But if now we have a technique which is able to distinguish correct estimates from incorrect, if you have a certain algorithm that is distinguishing and saying this is correct. And these are not correct. What we can do is that with the correct label, we can just backpropagate and improve the neural network. Essentially, I'm using this as a pseudo label, you know, at best time. And now that I'm improving the neural network, I can do again this on a new batch of data. This time, maybe my neural network got a little bit better, so I have two certifiable instances, I backpropagate them, and of the next time, I think things will get better and better, and I will have all the results that will be certifiable and be able to correct. So we have been pushing on these ideas, I mean, last two slides, but we have been pushing on these ideas. Again, we imagine that we have the neural network, and we have this corrector, which is the model-based optimization we're talking about so far. Then we put a certificate step, which is slightly different from the STP certification. We have to define new certificates. And the certification step is essentially saying the result is correct or not. And we've been showing these on a transaction of this paper. In the RSS last year, we have shown even that we can put in parallel multiple models and self supervise them at the same time. Um, without going too much into the details, the trends that we see are as follows. So these are the iterations of our self supervised training. And these are the percentage of, you know, forget of family, but the percentage of correct results. So you start with a network which is training simulation, it's pretty bad on real data. But as you go with the self supervised training, essentially the network gets better and better. And in this case, the network is trying to figure out what is the pose of an object. So given a point cloud, which is the one in green, a time zero is getting a pretty really bad guess. But as you go, like, you know, if you do self supervised learning, eventually you get a good pose for, uh, for the point cloud. So, last slide, I want to show you, like, you know, maybe a little bit more quantitative results. So here I'm showing the proposed approach, which is called the ensemble, is one in blue, and I'm comparing these against supervised baselines. So, Posey Pose, very famous, you might, you might have seen that, and it's 
supervise on labels, on the habitat, so it's fully supervised. And we're comparing that against also like, a self-supervised competitor, which is self C plus plus. And this is some distribution of levels, so you would like the distribution to be as much as possible to the top left, meaning that most of the points will have small efforts, small efforts. And you can say the proposed approach essentially will do is so pretty much the same as the supervised baseline, right? So it's slightly better, as in general you can see, and it's way better than other approaches for self-supervised learning. We have plenty of results for these qualitative results comparing uh, input point cloud with the result of our approach and with baselines which are supervised. Uh, so we do, we do. I think it's pretty promising. I think there's a lot of support here that's pretty promising. So I'm five minutes late, so we're going to wrap up here and summarize the three main messages that's going to send today. The first one is that scalable robot perception requires metric semantic uh, and hierarchical maps and of course algorithms to build them. The second is that self-safety critical applications require certifiable algorithms that are able to distinguish correct estimates from correct ones. And the last one is that once you're able to identify correct estimates, you can learn from them in a self-supervised way. And with that, I will thank the sponsors supporting our work and we thank you for uh, your attention. Questions? I know you have questions. Connor's got a question. So, um, thanks for the talk, by the way. Really, really great talk. Uh, very good. Um, the supervised, the self supervised part. Uh, were you estimating your neural network? Was it estimating features? Okay. So, key points, essentially key points, and then the model based optimization was kind of online. Points between the cut model and the ones that you get in the point cloud. So, how I'm going to just take a bit deeper on that. How can you use the certificate to then back up? Because the certificate just guarantees that you find for a given problem, right? Yeah, and by the way, like you mentioned, that it's much more like a certificate, it's a little bit more complicated in this sense because we don't use just the commodity of the, of the registration result, we also get the dense point cloud information. When we predict the CAD model to be, just to match where the point cloud is, so we have the model to the certification. Right. In a nutshell, I think it's very simple. Like, you know, the certificate is going to be 0, 1. So the certificate 0 means we have an incorrect output. 1 means we have a correct output. And the loss function we use to essentially control the certificates. So terms will pop up in the loss function for physical training if the like, you know, certificate is equal to 1, and it will appear if the results are not certified. But in practice, again, these are the that the first function you don't have to backpropagate to that. You do have to backpropagate to this. So in the result of the data, we show the backpropagate to the condition models, which uh, I didn't get to talk about. It's a like full contribution from the definition of it in a way that uh, the backpropagation is very simple. That's one of my points. Uh, thanks. So, so on this topic, so currently, all you're doing right now is if the, the certificate is negative, you just ignore the loss function. Have you looked at like trying to do some level of contrast with like the addition that if it's negative that you know? Yeah, the question I want is a great question to be honest. Like you know, it makes sense that you learn from mistakes rather than mm -hmm. just learning from what you get right. I don't know how to do that because um, here we are living like, and the estimates are living in a continuous space, right? The pose either is perfect or is a little bit away from perfect, but we don't know how much is away from being correct. So we really don't know how to use that bad results. To Contrasted loss, I don't know if it is as straightforward as it sounds like you do that. Because you would have to say, yeah, this, yeah, it's not immediate to me how to do that. If you guys have a this in that direction, this is already working pretty well in practice, which was surprising if you can have that deep for information and get a great subject of right approach. That will work as well. Can I ask one follow up while this slide is up? So, certificate fire is correct, but that could still mean that the robust corrector has correctly identified that some of the key points are outliers and just ignored them in producing the estimate. So do you backpropagate the outliers or only yeah. the inliers? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit on this part. You know, the robust corrector here, sending quite different from one of the previous part. Senate uh, is a middle ground between the, the 
previous part, which are like key points, but it's kind of a nice key flavor to it, which is to align the dense information. So we don't just worry about the optimality there, we just look at the bit of like, you know, our estimate with respect to the data. Okay. So it's not as mathematically elegant as the previous part, but we, we have a notion of, uh, we have concepts which are uh, essentially this dense setting, they're, they're essentially understanding what is correct and what is not correct. It's interesting because you know you need two elements, like you know, which is cascade correctness in this setup, which are dense point clouds. In one element, which is the CAD model you predict has to be close to the point cloud that you observe, but of course there is an element in which you have to see enough of the point cloud to be sure, and we're able to formalize that cloud. So that is pretty nice, but a little bit detached from the optimization uh, certificates. Yeah. yeah, you have to look at the papers, like you know, it's, it's a different, it's in a sense a way to extend the ideas of uh, certified or optimality to more of a learning based setup in which you do not have a loss fund. You know, you do not. You're not caring about optimality anymore, you just want to check the result. If you're hiring for local maps, um, I know most of the examples were for indoor settings, like big buildings and rooms. Uh, do you think that's still like a good representation, say, if you're exploring like a forest or like a cave or something like that? Yeah, I also get the, <laughs> the question a lot is uh, it's something that you know, we've been working on. It is a hierarchy of south doors. So you are in a city, you there are roads, there are uh, intersections, there are neighborhoods, there are you know, uh, cities themselves, like you know, continents, blah, blah, blah. You can go up and interact as much as you want. Uh, the question is what are the layers of this, uh, this representation? Something that we did not want to do is that for each problem we have, we want to manually design what is the hierarchy. In indoor, you can do that because you know, there is a clear hierarchy of rooms, buildings, and so on. In outdoors, like, you know, whatever different environment you consider, you would have a different hierarchy. Um, so we've been working on that. The solution we have right now, like, you know, which is not published, hopefully we'll be out like, in a couple of weeks, is about defining an ontology, which is, these are all the concepts that potentially you can care about. We arrange that general ontology as a hierarchical graph, and then we train some network to classify these, or to group places, you know, the graph of places into these high-level concepts. And, uh, yeah, there's much more to say, like, you know, but uh, uh, we use a fancy neural network, which is something called the logic tensor network, to also enforce logical roots. For example, you want to enforce that uh, um, um, if there are many trees in the forest, like, you know, it's just a random example, but we get putting that in a way that we don't just need to blindly throw data at the problem, but we can also enforce some manual knowledge to do learning with raw data, small data. Yeah, but that's an important problem. And I think um, I've seen recent papers, meaning over the last maybe three weeks or so, a group of work from Burger is doing three D graphs for urban environments, and uh, maybe Henry Christensen was also doing some outdoor application. So it seems that a bunch of people are also thinking about that problem. So I have a question about the first one is about No, uh, in the sense that you know the type of results here are more appro universal approximation type of results, but will not give you a practical recipe about you know, the low level details of the applicate of the architecture and not even like you know, low level details of uh, message passing. And indeed the proofs, the way we show the approximation result in the proof, we come up with a message passing scheme which is very simple, which is not the same used in practice. So there is a little bit of a gap in the proof and the, in the actual results. Uh, in practice, we see that uh, something not, not super surprising is that the number of message passing iteration has to be like, you know, related to the diameter of the graph. Because if you do too many you know, rounds of message passing, you smooth out the information across the graph. If you do less than that, you don't reach all the graph. That's more of an empirical situation. Uh, the other question is about uh, some of the In the last part, which is the self-supervised, the, the certificates I was talking about will get, get you, like, you know, to an epsilon type of guarantees on the correctness because we want to account for noise, like you know, measurements and things like that. In the second part of the talk, instead, it's more like you know, either you get the optimal solution or not. But when you get some, maybe you don't get the optimal solution, you get some suboptimality gap. 
maybe you can still believe that to how far you are from optimal. If uh, you look at which it's constant of the function, you can still probably get the neighborhood, like the of the optimal solution. Um, also for the second part, you know, there is much more to say. Like, you know, so I would like to have to interested in the topic, but you know, go and read the papers because there are two aspects which uh, I feel I have to stress because otherwise I wouldn't be fair here. Uh, first of all is that optimality and correctness are two different things. So to get, we do get optimality guarantees. To get correctness guarantees, we have to do an extra step, which is what we call estimation contracts. So estimation contracts is say, essentially you need condition on the input data under which optimality is equal correctness. You can imagine that if as input to the problem just pass 100% outliers, there is no estimator that can get, even, even an optimal estimator will not give you the, the output. So we, we have this estimation contract saying, you know, you need enough in liars. You need in liars, we found the noise type of things, and then we can guarantee that optimality is equal to correctness. So that's one thing that uh, is not apparent from the talk because there is much more to say, but you know, I have to mention that. And the second thing I have to mention, like the full disclaimer, is that uh, uh, we get polynomial time algorithms, but polynomial time and real time are different, right? And many of you, like, you know, be familiar with what I'm talking about, but some of these algorithms, depending on the problem, they're either very fast or they're not. So polynomial time, like, you know, can get you to do something that, you know, maybe is not reasonable to run a real time on a robot to be. Hopefully, we will be in a few years, but not now. Uh, give you, like, a much longer answer than what you asked <laughs> Anybody else? Adam? Junction key, and then you do message passing. 
So it's the same idea, like uh, we are very explicit about that part. That's like you know, the, the nice part where the insights from standard and you know, probabilistic graphical models, you are adjusting them to graph neural networks. What you get here for free is that uh, all the message passing is learned, right? So compared to traditional probabilistic graphical models, you do not have one upload factors, that is, we do that for you. So in that sense, it's still much better, but the insights are exactly the ones you're referring to. Uh, there are technical limits, and this is uh, slightly different from junction theory. For a little competition, you have to do a little bit more expansion, but you know, small technical limits, not technical. Uh, so, they mean like a possible looping graph in front of the tree, and this will mean that some reason is somehow you can see the tree. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why you don't see large trees and you don't see a lot of groups about that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, there is not, as far as I understand, there is not a nice relation between the peak size and the limit, but that's my intuition. Also, the uh, low limit, we guarantee that you know, there are not you know, these large or bad peaks, which would mean that uh, you don't need to make this exponential in size, but you can give much more in That's the intuition. Okay, let's thank Luca again for next one. I think now we're just supposed to mingle and eat. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you.